question. So we have about 30% of young middle-aged people who say socialism is the ideal system and who also define it as state ownership of the means of production. Welcome to the IA podcast. My name is Harrison Griffiths, I'm Communications Officer at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Each week this podcast asks a tantalising policy question to a top political and economic thinker. Today's question, how can we stop young people flocking to socialism? The Realities of Socialism project, led by the Fraser Institute, in partnership with the IEA in the UK, the Institute for Public Affairs in Australia and the Fund for American Studies in the United States, has conducted new polling showing that 53% of Britons under 35 prefer socialism as their ideal economic model. To discuss this, I'm joined by Christian Nemitz, the IA's Head of Political Economy and the author of Left Turn Ahead, IA research on the increasing popularity of socialism. In addition to Left Turn Ahead, Christian has also written various books, papers, articles, blogs and tweets on the history of socialism and its resurgent popularity in the West. Christian, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. Talk a little bit more about what the paper told us beyond the main headline figure. Yes, uh, what's interesting about this one, or let's say I wasn't surprised by the main finding that you mentioned, uh, which is 53% of millennials and Zoomers um, saying that socialism is the ideal system for the United Kingdom. That's uh, more or less in line with what we've seen in previous surveys. Uh, as always, when the term socialism comes up among young middle-aged audiences you get massive approval you always have far more people who are supportive of socialism than are against it or supportive of capitalism and in that regard this report just confirms what we already knew that's not really a novelty what's innovative about it is that they tried to uh, clarify what people actually mean when they say socialism because that's been one of the problems with some of the previous surveys that uh, they just throw this word out there uh, everyone interprets it in their own way thinking um, well defining it as whatever they think it means doesn't become clear and uh, you might then get approval or disapproval but people really talking about different things in this report they try to clarify that and they've done this in two ways. Uh, the first one is um, they repeat the same questions but they use the word communism rather than socialism so a more radical sounding more unambiguous word and they just look at how that changes the results and there's quite a lot of variation so this is a cross-country as you're seeing cross-country uh, polling in Canada uh, just substituting communism for socialism more or less uh, eradicates the apparent support for socialism. So there it's it would be fair to say it's mostly a semantic confusion. Uh, there's loads of people in Canada who say socialism is great but communism, oh no we don't want that. In Britain unfortunately that doesn't happen. So uh, if you swap the words, if you, if you say communism rather than socialism, support does drop but uh, among millennials and Zoomers, not that much. Uh, it's less than half. So you still get about 30% or so uh, in that age group who, uh, even if you say, uh, if you use the more radical sounding word communism, you, you get more or less, uh, you still get a huge amount of approval, about 30% who say that is the ideal economic system for, for the United Kingdom. And um, yeah, that's a pretty bad result. Uh, and also, the other way they try to do it is uh, try, to, try to tease out what people mean by the term socialism is they just ask them directly they provide three definitions um, they overlap so you can you can uh, agree with all of them in principle and, and quite a lot of them do uh, one of them is the old dictionary definition where they just say uh, socialism uh, means the state taking over companies and industries, so state-run economy, a conventional classic definition. Another one is, well, something that is probably better described as social democracy, uh, where they say um, guaranteed minimum income for everyone. And then there's one definition that's somewhere in between, where you have the state providing services, not just financing, but uh, being the main provider, but again, that's something that we already have, that's not fundamentally different from the status quo. And basically they, they test uh, what's the, uh, how do people react to these definitions. Uh, it turns out the, uh, the social democratic ones are more popular, more people pick those, 
but still among uh, British millennials, again, almost half choose the, the dictionary definition and uh, only about one in four so disapprove so uh, only one in four actively say no that's not what socialism means so again in and at least in the case of britain and in the case of younger people you can't say that they just misunderstand the word in canada that's more or less what happens there uh, there's more people who reject that dictionary definition than people who say yes that's what socialism means so there it would be fine to say well they just confused the terminology. In Britain, that's not what we see. And you can understand, I suppose, in North America, you would see there's more sort of taboo around that word because of the mm. Cold War legacy than there would be in the UK, where we're a fair few years after Ash Sarkar famously went on, good morning Britain, and said, I'm literally a communist, appears Morgan. Um, but more broadly, should we maybe take a little nugget of optimism from some of the findings of this poll? You see that there is support in sort of the mid 40% for capitalism as a good economic system. You see more support among very young people, 18 to 25 and 25 to 34, for capitalism as the ideal economic system. And as you've already said, there is more support among the wider populace for a more watered down version of socialism. We don't have a budding crop of Leninists across the country. A lot of these people are dealing in more government, more social democracy. Mm -hmm. Is there maybe not a little bit of optimism to be had from that? Yeah, maybe a little. I don't normally do optimism, as you know, but um, yes, that's true. So I was slightly surprised by the capitalism question, uh, where they asked the same question that they asked for, for socialism and communism, uh, asked the same thing about capitalism. Do you think that's the ideal economic system? And yeah, I think 45% was, was figure who, who said, yes, that is the ideal economic system. I, I wouldn't have expected that. Uh, I would have expected hardly any young person to say uh, capitalism is good, because that's what we saw in, in some of the previous surveys, where only about one in five or so had anything positive to say about capitalism. In this survey, substantially higher. So that's uh, that's better than expected, good as it gets. Uh, on the uh, the meaning of, of socialism, yeah, that's a bit more mixed. I mean, I've, I've never uh, assumed that everyone who says, like in our previous survey where, where we had, I think, 67% saying, I want to live in a socialist system, I never assumed that all of them want to live in a Marxist-Leninist society. But the question is, uh, is always, uh, what exactly is the split between actual socialists and confused social democrats? Is it, um, are the actual socialists, is that one in 10 people? Is it one in five? Is it uh, one in three? And uh, yeah, judging from this report, it's around half of those who say, um, who have positive things to say about socialism. So they also, uh, they, they repeat this, um, these questions about the various definitions. Uh, is socialism, is it state ownership? Is it minimum income? Is it state services? They repeat that question specifically for those who say they approve of socialism. Yeah. And among those, more than half uh, approve of the classic definition. So when, when somebody tells you, uh, I think socialism is the best economic system for Britain, uh, more than half of those pick the, uh, the, the classic definition of socialism. They also pick the other ones. Uh, they're not, uh, as I said, they're not mutually exclusive. I'd say the, um, I would have picked, I think, one and a half of those. Uh, I, I would, of course, have picked the dictionary definition, but also state provision of services. Yeah, that's maybe not quite part of the definition, but that's usually what socialism does involve, that the state um, also runs the hospitals and the schools and the daycare centers uh, for, for the same reason that in socialism uh, state runs more or less everything. So uh, you can pick several of those uh, definitions, can pick all three of them. Uh, but they certainly also, the, mo the majority of those who approve of socialism also approve of the classic dictionary definition. So we have about 30% of young middle-aged people who say socialism is the ideal system and who also define it as state ownership of the means of production. And you also, there is a, an ambiguity in some in the sort of other more diluted socialisms where there is a very big difference between that public services element 
uh, on one hand to someone who's a very radical social democrat, which you know even Jeremy Corbyn's 2017-2019 manifesto is probably fell under that umbrella of just mm. a lot of government ownership, the default assumption being, I think it's good, the government ought to pay for it and run it, versus somebody like you know Noah Smith in America, supply-side progressives who are yeah. very pro-market and like a bit more distribution than you, you or I would, I suppose. So, that, I mean, that, that ambiguity does still sit a little bit um, in, in the fray. Uh, while we have got a little bit of Nemitz optimism, I've managed to bring forth a tiny bit, overall, it's fairly clear that these results are not what we would like to see and they do confirm a massive trend in the last 10-15 years towards a more favourable view of socialism, particularly among young people. What do you think is the driving force behind this trend that we are seeing? Is it material, social, political in its purest sense? Yeah, the, this particular report doesn't go into the causes, so they they don't. Oh, well, they also look at how does this differ across uh, between different educational groups or income, other factors. Uh, but they they don't really come up with anything novel, and they don't try to to analyze it. So uh, there, there's nothing really new to say, apart from I think we talked about this in earlier episodes that I think it's it's. Basically, a mix of um, that. First, the socialism has escaped that association with the sectarian fringe groups that it was previously. That always, uh, well, not always, but for a quarter century or so, that used to be a PR problem for socialists that they were associated with crank groups uh, who would argue about some old Trotskyite texts from the 30s and... Um, a bit like where we are now. <laughs> yeah, more yeah. yeah, or less. And that would be quite off-putting for a lot of normal people. And uh, But socialism has since then become the normal people ideology and, and now we are the crank fringe groups, uh, the, the people who defend markets. I mean, how cringe is that? And um, so there, there's this reputational change. And But also there are material factors. I think it would be harder to make that case if, uh, if well, if we had, if there was a clear sense that things are improving, and that's not been the case in, well, economically, uh, not been the case for for median income owners in general, but particularly younger people, of course, uh, got a rougher deal with with the housing crisis and everything that's going on. And the fact that this poll demarcates 35 and below and 35 and above I think is very interesting, not just because there's always traditionally been a split at around that age. It used to be that you'd get a mortgage and your first hefty tax bill and become a little bit less of a socialist. Now that's not so much the case, but at 35, you're looking over the 15 years since the 2008 financial crash. That's most of their lives where they've been economically active and politically aware. And in that time, you know, they've had a succession of, you say, raw deals. They've had the 2008 crash and then the subsequent sort of bailout of the financial institutions and the, the bad economic outcomes from it. They've had the rise of populism and Trump, Brexit. They've had stagnant wages. The prospect of home ownership is more and more remote, we may be the first generation to do less well than our parents. Are there policy changes we can advocate that will improve the material uh, loss of young people? Uh, and do you think that if we could implement them, and they worked, that it would change this trend? Or do you think it's now, you know, in-baked? Among the older cohorts, uh, now it might well be too late to fundamentally change things, even if you now had a massive economic boom and a house building boom and things massively improving across the board. Uh, attitudes at some point don't change so quickly anymore, but it's more about, it's, it's, I think if we had had great economic conditions for the past 15 years. Uh, I don't think millennials would ever have become a generation of free marketeers or a generation of whatever conservatives or, or something else. Um, they would always have been a left-leaning generation. It's more about how much enthusiasm do you put into that? Uh, is this something that 
you just say because you know that's the, the fashionable approved opinion or is this something that you're prepared to get actively involved in? Would you actively join a socialist movement? Would you join a demonstration or, or whatever? Or is that something that you just stick into your social media profile as be, to signal I'm on the fashionable side but you don't do much with it? I think that's the kind of difference that uh, say a better housing market would make. It's not that they would suddenly say, uh, okay, now I'm a Friedmanite or now I'm a Hayekian. They might still call themselves socialists, or they'll call themselves left-wing, but a significant chunk of them probably wouldn't do much about it. And that would be the big difference. And I'd already be happy with that. If you had uh, non-practicing socialists who um, use the word socialism sometimes, but then don't do much, then I'd say, well, I'm not really bothered about that. But it's more the, it has become, uh, you have seen, uh, there has been a socialist movement springing up around this, and they're quite vocal and active, and, and that's uh, a change that could have been avoided, spe uh, specifically with better housing policies. But nonetheless, uh, I have to say, while it's understandable, given the experiences that these people have made, uh, and you mentioned them, um, it's understandable that they're not terribly happy about the status quo and that they would be looking for alternatives. I still think, well, why does that alternative have to be socialism? And there's, there's plenty of ideas floating around. Why couldn't they have picked something else? Uh, because specifically on the housing issue, uh, last week, I think it was, we've seen th there's been a report by uh, the Centre for Cities um, about the British housing crisis. Uh, quite interesting. They look at uh, performance uh, on, on house building, housing affordability uh, in Britain and the rest of, of Western Europe and how that's evolved over the post-war decades. They compare, they have one graph uh, which was quite striking or, or table where they look at uh, housing space per household uh, in the early 90s. So to compare the, the level of, of, of housing, um, of, of, of comfortable living um, across Western Europe and they show that well, Britain is close to the bottom of that table, so uh, one of the, uh, the smallest uh, amounts of housing space per, per household, uh, living in more cramped conditions than, than people elsewhere. Uh, only East Germany was doing worse there. So they, they uh, since the early 90s, they, count, they still count East Germany as a, as a country in its own right. So you would think, well, okay, you have a literal socialist country until a year before, uh, and a country with a heavily socialized housing policy, and they're the ones doing worst. And you have West Germany uh, and, and Switzerland doing far better. So how can anyone look at this uh, and think, oh, socialism must be the solution? Yeah. I mean, that's beyond me. I mean, that's just pretty staggering on its own that not only are we only uh, beating a very socialist country that very few people consider to be a great economic model, but also a country that doesn't exist anymore and hasn't for quite some time. It really is truly staggering. Um, the, the, the question about uh, sort of uh, why people have responded to become socialist in particular, uh, it, it sort of seems to defy from the free market view the normal political gravity with these things. So take 79 when Mrs Thatcher came in, you had seen the post-war consensus uh, put to a, a pretty sort of strong extent to the public, put it into place, uh, and the Labour government's failure had sort of sealed that failure in the, in the minds of the body politic, and so in comes its antithesis, Margaret Thatcher, and then eventually people get a bit bored of that, and they go to Blair's third wayism, and so on and so forth. Mm. Now, from our angle, we've got a lot to complain about when it comes to the present economy. We would argue there is too much state intervention. We would argue that the government interferes in too many parts of individuals' lives. Uh, and yet, the prospect of uh, a massive free market movement erupting seems pretty remote. And that's partly because, you know, in post-2008 era, uh, the type of capitalism that under 35s sort of think that they hate uh, has not only, we would argue, been far from a good model based on sound free market economics, but also implemented and defended particularly in the UK and the US, by the segments of politics who claim to be defending capitalism 
yeah. from the left. Do we as free marketers need to do a better job of clearly demarcating ourselves from the broad right-wing political movement who often claim to love capitalism but will favour quite strong intervention from the state either in the name of pragmatism or in the name of their chosen pet issue that they really care about? I think we do. And I don't mean that in the sense of uh, that we should be exaggeratedly purist. Uh, I, I accept that if you want to get things implemented uh, in politics, that always has to be part of a broader coalition. I'm not aware of, of any country where uh, you have where you've ever had a government based purely on on free market liberalism, uh, it, it would always be somehow part of a broader coalition, and that's all well and good. But uh, when when you have a government that quite actively um, works towards constraining the housing supply, uh, then as a liberal, I would say, well, if if that's uh, one of the defining issues uh, that the country faces, the housing crisis and you have a government uh, that works actively towards entrenching that and strengthening NIMBY resistance to house building even further, then it's not uh, absurdly purist to say, no, sorry, I've, I've got nothing to do with these people and I don't want to be associated with them. And um, I think distinctions of that kind, that we, re we really have to make. The big difference between 97, uh, uh, 79 and now is that, as you said, at the time there was a, a perception that uh, the post-war consensus model has been tried and it's been exhausted. This, this was um, yeah, a, a logical conclusion, uh, the window of discontent, and that's maybe as, as far as that model can be taken. Uh, one of the problems that liberals have had post Thatcher is that there was a widespread perception that Britain is already a free market economy. I think a lot of people see Britain as far more liberal and market based than it actually is. If we look at uh, economic freedom indices from, from nowadays and, and recent years, uh, Britain is by no means uh, uh, an outstanding example of, of free market economics. Maybe there was a brief period when uh, when that would have been the case, uh, more or less within limits. But if so, that's that's uh, been gone for for quite a while. Um, but somehow the perception still lingers that you have statist Europe, free market America, Britain being somewhere in between. And um, it's, it's a bit like with other types of national stereotypes, that they are often one or two generations behind the country they seem to describe, or they're, they're trying to describe. And that can be true of, of socio-economic models as well, that, uh, that what was different about the Thatcher period was that she was quite overtly pro-market and used the rhetoric of a free market here and that was that was all good uh, that that had to happen uh, whereas in when other Western European countries had market-based reforms uh, it was usually done in a more quiet way uh, it would be say Sweden had a period when they had uh, quite a lot of privatization going on even France had that but they didn't have governments in place that would actively bang the drum for free markets or uh, prime ministers who would describe themselves as free marketeers. They, they would just do it without really talking about it. So therefore you may have had similar results but uh, a very different rhetoric and people in those countries would not have the perception that they live in um, in a laissez-faire free market economy. Whereas in Britain quite a lot of people and among the commentariat uh, a lot of people have that idea that uh, that Britain is the, the free market beacon of, of, of Europe at least and then it, of course people start asking okay if this is Europe's free market economy and if it's doing worse than its neighbours in some respects uh, what's so great about free markets then? That's true. And, and finally when we make these arguments into the future and particularly make these arguments for young people in the situation we find ourselves where the prevailing political wind is to the left and yet the government of the day, economically at least, is fairly left-wing already. Uh, is a slice of that radicalism 
uh, in some ways warranted for, for two reasons. One, we're not that politically relevant anymore. The Thatcherians and the legacy of that has definitely now evaporated completely. And also that while the, the very extreme socialists, young or otherwise, probably won't get their way at any point in the UK, they have definitely pulled the conversation left. Yeah. And by being bold and radical, we can appeal to you know young, idealistic people like myself um, and the rest uh, in order to pull the conversation in our direction, even if we don't end up getting everything we want, even if we don't have a country where 60% of people want to privatise pavements. Yeah. Yes, but uh, there we have to be careful. We, we shouldn't uh, fall into the trap of... Uh, we should try to make clear that this isn't... When we say the, the economy that we currently live in is quite far away from a free market economy, uh, this isn't meant in the way in which socialists say, oh, that wasn't real socialism. We shouldn't, uh, we should make, we should be careful not to sound as if the argument was real free market capitalism has never been tried. But uh, that when we criticize, um, well, the gap between the status quo and what a market solution uh, would look like, uh, we have to be quite specific. You can't just generally say, oh no, that's not a proper free market. Uh, you have to point to specific interventions uh, and specific yes. laws, specific institutions and say, look, this is clearly getting in the way of entrepreneurs doing this or that. If you didn't have this law, if you didn't have that institution, then we would be closer. Uh, then that would be very different from just broadly and generally in, in abstract terms saying that's got nothing to do with me because it's not a real free market. Uh, we have to make that, that case, uh, that, that radicalism and show that uh, being a free market here doesn't mean defending the status quo. It, it does mean uh, you have your own ideals and principles and, and advocate something on that basis. But we also have to, um, have to make sure that we're being specific enough and still try to deal where possible in real world examples um, so that it wouldn't be the oh here's this shining utopia it's never been tried but trust me i know how to deliver it but more well here's a country there's a country that's a bit or, or quite a bit closer uh, working pretty well why don't we look at that experience and in a lot of the sectors that where uh, where the the complaints are that that most of the complaints are about, that is absolutely possible. I mentioned the, uh, the Centre for Cities report where they look at housing supply uh, across Western Europe. They, they also find positive examples um, of, again, not perfectly utopian free market paradises, but, but simply uh, countries with more liberal land use planning systems and, and where house building would mostly be driven by the private sector and that can absolutely be done. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to make the perfect the enemy of the good, but what we can do in pretty much every area is find some example that's at least quite good and that would usually be quite market oriented as well. And that's the kind of argument we have to make. Excellent. Well, here's to that. And Let's hope it can work, and perhaps when the next IEA head of political economy and the next IEA communications officer have this conversation in 25 years, we'll be talking about how cool we are and how <laughs> low status it is to be a comic. Thank you very much for joining me, Christian. Pleasure. Thank you all very much for watching and listening. Please read the uh, Fraser Institute's new report for the realities of socialism project linked in the description below. Thank you very much. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.